I'm Giovanni Singleton, coordinator of Lunch Poems Program. Thank you all for being here today. Um, and I would also like to thank the University Library, this beautiful room for hosting us. Um, I invite you all to sign up on our email list, which is at the librarian's desk. And also be sure to pick up a poster um, which outlines our um, events for the entire year. They're quite lovely. Redesign. Um, also, uh, on our website, lunchpoems.berkeley.edu, you can find a recording of this video um, along with all of our past programs. So be sure to check it out. Um, so next month, please come back and join us on November 1st for a reading by Pulitzer Prize winning poet Taimba Jess. Um, now I would like to welcome Director of Lunch Poems, Jeffrey G. O'Brien, who will introduce this afternoon's poet. Thank you. Thank you, Giovanni, and thank you all for being here. We're really happy to have Fadi here. Um, a note about preservation. Poetry has long liked to boast about how relatively indestructible its materials are and that therefore it's a good technology for preserving things about the world, however immaterially, whether it's the beloved um, maintained against its body's going or noting ephemera like butterflies. Um, in fact, po poems also want to even preserve um, decreation or entropy, the cracks in the wall against the butterfly on the cover of Fadi's book. Um, Fadi is certainly a poet of preservation, among other things, um, but he's also a physician. Is preservation one of um, medicine's mandates? It's one way we could describe it, but not the only way. I think that's why when Judah looks at a body, he sees both its liveliness and vigor and all of the potential dooms that might beset it and thinks that those are both crucial ways of considering it in the world and its relations to other persons and things in the world. I just want to quote a moment from a poem in Footnotes in the Order of Disappearance called Progress Notes Towards the End um, about treating cadavers. He had the most beautiful muscles of all 32 bodies that were neatly arranged, zipped up as if a mass grave had been disinterred. And I think there you can see that painful and lovely ratio of both preservation and noting threats to preservation, the anonymity of a mass grave, a body after its subject has in many ways left it, and yet it's still being an occasion for praise and beauty. Um, there are other agents and technologies in the world that like to preserve. Nation states are one. Um, they tend to want to preserve themselves primarily at the expense of other kinds of beings and entities. Um, there's a moment in this book that speaks to that. Great art needs no nation. I think that that is something I agree with. Um, and when nations preserve themselves, they often do so by making their states run over prior states, bulldozing and resettling. That's certainly something animating this book. Um, but finally, it's also a book of poetry that wants to think about preserving words themselves, even as they do the other kinds of work of preservation I've noted. This is um, a geek's book in some ways. You'll find the word allele, you'll find the word mitochondriac, you'll find the plumeria. Um, it wants to preserve all of the ways of talking about and naming the parts of the body and the parts of the supportive, erosive thing that we call world. Let's hear some more of those words from Fadi. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you, Jeffrey. That's very kind and generous. Um, so, um, I think that this book for me is about um, my continued conversation with how to articulate the body in various forms of what a body is for all of us, cliche a trope that that may be for a living human being, um, both the, you know, the body that we inhabit and the bodies that we belong to, whether geopolitical or uh, erotic or, uh, 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 or mortal, uh, primarily. So, um, and so the book is uh, done in uh, 
pentads, if you will, five poem sections, and they move with some illusion from one idea of body to the next, which uh, probably overlap against the illusion of, of this specific demarcation of what a body is. Um, so I'll just uh, begin reading and, and uh, yeah, hopefully I won't lull you to sleep. Uh, progress notes, which is what doctors write after the, a patient is initially admitted or interviewed or, you know. The age of portrait is drugged. Beauty is symmetry so rare, it's a mystery. My left eye is smaller than my right. My big mouth shows my nice teeth perfectly aligned like Muslims in prayer. My lips, an accordion. Each sneeze, a facial thumbprint. One corner of my mouth hangs downward when I want to hold a guffaw hostage. Bell's palsy, perhaps, or what Mark Twain said about steamboat piloting, that a doctor is unable to look upon the blush in a young beauty's face without thinking it could be a fever, a malar rash, a butterfly announcing a wolf. Can I lie face down now as cadavers posed on first anatomy lesson? I didn't know mine was a woman until three weeks later we turned her over. Out of reverence, there was to be no untimely exposure of donors our patrons who were covered in patches of scrub green dish towels. And by semester's end, we were sick of all that, tossed mega livers and mammoth hearts into lab air and caught them. My body was Margaret. That's what the death certificate said when it was released before finals. The cause of her death, nothing memorable frail old age. But the colonel on table 19 with an accessory spleen had put a bullet through his temple, a final prayer. Not an entry or exit where their skull cracks to condemn the house of death, no shattered glass in the brain, only a smooth tunnel of deep violet that bloomed in concentric circles. The weekends were lonely he had the most beautiful muscles of all 32 bodies that were neatly arranged, zipped up as if a mass grave had been disinterred. Or, when unzipped and facing the ceiling, had cloth over their eyes as if they'd just been executed. Gray, silver hair, chiseled countenance. He was 67, a veteran of more than one war. I had come across that which will end me, extend me, at least once, without knowing it. I'm such a glum reader. <laughs> First Love, this is a very short poem. When God began you, she said to me one spring afternoon in bed, God began with your hands, a woman's hands. And when God reached your wrists, God made the rest of you man. Horses. December evening, smoke in the rain, on of the rain, from Virga to Drizzle, a glimpse of horses through large wooden doors, trunks immortal, a menage which in Dutch rhymes with Malaysia, warm bloods in the training ring, seven in a trotting circle spun up to a canter, motion sustained, round and round 28 hooves tap dance 28 lungs, all women riders, the da Vinci shoulders, breasts, thighs, fibers, fascicles, foam and stalactite, stalactites from equine jaws more exhausted than a crossroad, steam rising to the roof, the sinews of their hearts. The women were one, the horses one. 
For miles and miles, rooted to the ring's rail, I rode along. From one body to the next, I crossed as in a single body. The bridges are endless. The riders dismounted, led the horses to their stalls, drew vapor clouds idly away from the eye of the fugue. One rider stayed on her horse. Her smile held me. Her chest was still rising, falling, but when she spoke, the air was well at ease. How long have you been riding for? She asked me. I don't know how, I said. All the horses I never rode, their magnetic fields filled with souls of past riders and horses past souls, even the plastic ones I used to line up on the cell. Oh, she said, though it's conceivable, she was asking me about something altogether different. My heart's a doze, a doze made for running away. I, I think many of you might uh, know the um, famous um, Whitman picture. I think it might be his last portrait or something with him holding the moth, the cardboard moth. And so I wrote this, you know, almost like a direct description, uh, which I found interesting in its directness as I wrote it out. So it's called Footnotes to a Picture. Um, yeah, I won't talk more about it. But And there are some uh, quotations in the beginning from, yeah, from comments made about the photo. Where it was psyche, his soul, his fixed contemplation, the renowned psychiatrist said of his friend's pose, where during the final decade of the poet's life, the butterfly was classified on the Indian subcontinent, where Leptosia Nina, wandering snowflake, takes to low fragile flight, its wings tipping grass, where in twilight he sat down, clad in cardigan in the city of romance, where a plump cardboard moth had synthetically alighted on his outstretched index, the visible rubber band in daguerreotype, the lepidoptera in equilibrium, and on its hind wings some words, not his, housed in the Library of Congress, where, yes, that was an actual moth, the picture is substantially literal, we were good friends during my in and out of taming or fraternizing with some of the insects, where their swarms and migratory shadows and the current they ride up, I ride up, where it isn't all water when it rains. So he did, they, they, they did supposedly ask Walt in an interview and he said, Yes, that was an actual moth. The picture is substantially literal. So I find this uh, a beautiful, belligerent lie. Um, anyone here been to uh, Big Bend National Park? You have? Wow. You're my heroes. Well, there's a poem in here about it. So it's called National Park. I won't read it since there's just two of you. Um, so yeah, I, um, speaking of, of the body um, as a doctor and also trying to see how eros can enter this language, uh, there are a couple of poems here called Plethora and um, Epith Epithalamian, and uh, I'll just read Plethora. It's a short one. About the praise I dish your way, jails the comeuppance of a liar poet. My only want is your content, and if I hold another want, may I never be granted it. Each full moon is born of a crescent, yet what's a full moon got? Vitiligo. And the morning sees me with eyes of dew, a fever breaking out, on your integument. On your skin, exanthem is a pasture of anemones. Because you're one of them, 
I love my enemies. Hmm. Oh. I'm a, a father also, so the scream that startled me while I was on my knees depositing my son one morning in the kindergarten line stationed in the cafeteria slash theater slash gym where he sits facing the stage amid 12 rows, 12 rows of kids waiting for the bell. That pierce came from behind, from a boy with bloody nose, his fingers bearing the coagulating fluid of his life. I, a doctor with warm sweat invading my pores, turned toward him and cupped his face as in a prayer. A mother, not his mother, came with paper towel, wiped off his nose, and left as fast as she came into the scene. The evidence erased, the boy stopped crying. I asked him, what happened? He pointed to the boy behind him. I questioned the accused and he seized into absence. A nurse came and took Abel. I stroked Cain's hair, his frightened stare, gorgeous eyes, he was beautiful. Footnotes to a song. Thank you for quoting these things. I'm honoring uh, Jeffrey's uh, quotes by reading the poems that he quoted from, so it helps. Um, I'm not very good at picking my poems when I read. Echo has no compass. We trace each other's dermatomes. No ecstasy without betrayal. Not all who live in flames are saints. Great art needs no nation. In memory, country, size is one. Great nations need great art. Soliloquy, a mother tongue. The surface tension of a Jesus bug opiates me. We reach a cemetery to each a cemetery. What is seen ends, even if its ending isn't seen. Tethered to a trope, great nations need great despair. Great despair needs nary a nation. My grief for a grievance, we're radiocarbon. Your grief for a grievance, we're mitochondriacs. Um, as I was writing this book, um, I didn't really know if it was going to be a book until I began this unexpected correspondence with a good friend, uh, a Syrian Kurd poet who writes in Arabic, uh, a poet, essayist, translator, um, who is also a physician and gave up practice of medicine uh, early and then also had to escape Syria and into France with his wife, Julan Haji. And we, um, there were these, uh, you know, we had mutual friends um, and, and one of them is the wonderful poet and, and translator and, and critic, uh, Marilyn Hacker. And there, was the, there were these moments where he and I began to communicate in, in Arabic uh, through email, phone conversations, and the few times that we met. And I'm not sure what moment suddenly, um, well, I know, I know what moment, I'll, I'll read that poem, suddenly hit in my brain that we were writing poems without intending to write poems. And so I began to, so I, I told him, and I told him that I would, um, that I would take the bulk of our correspondence now and, and turn it into poetry. Um, and I, I, I didn't really, I, it felt uh, like a, a moment of integrity for me um, because I do have my issues with the uh, uh, problematic of the poetry of witness, so-called. Um, 
and uh, which is often not a lived experience, but turns out to be a textual one. Um, and even if it is lived, um, there, there is a problem of agency. Um, and so there was this a different moment where I can write these poems with another person, so they're in collaboration, where they also um, confuse the cult of originality that I think we're also quite obsessed with in, uh, in writing in general. Um, because we can understand, for example, that Henry James references Shakespeare left and right, but we would never, you know, it, it, it doesn't detract from his originality. But if there's a direct relationship to a source, to a nearby source in time, then our idea of originality somehow changes. So I wanted to persist with that. And that section is called Sagittal Views. So the first poem is, in those 10 poems, it's called After No Language. A silent feeling of an invisible punishment or one seen through cataracts, a sentence that isn't meted out and doesn't end. Some cuts run deeper than speech. Writing may exit the cage, but the cage remains and grows, or am I speaking of the life of a footnoter? I always hold back from writing in the margins of the clearest sentences. Those that lost their statues as feeling once they were excised by skillful hands wielding sharp instruments, a manufacture of refraction. A while back, I saw a commercial in black and white for a detergent. Its customer was imprisoned in a soap bubble that can't be breached, a second transparent skin he can't exit before the commercial ends. I think it was inspired by a Chinese man who was jailed for life as a child inside an iron ball. As he grew, the penalty, the ball, grew until it was no longer possible to tell his blood from the ball's rust. And I can't remember what he was punished for. No silence offers answers. I'll read the last poem of that section. In a cemetery under a solitary walnut tree that crows had planted and whose seeds are hollow, I found a needle and with it I dug a well, dug and dug until I struck ink. The needle wove fabric for bodies it had injected with song. I painted the well's walls with quick climb and couldn't climb out. There was sun, there was moonlight that came into my sleep. I stored leaves and bark, but rain washed away my words. A lantern came down on a rope that a girl held. I sent up the part of me that was light. So, just to make sure. Uh, too many poems. Okay. Short one or long one? Okay, so, um, you know, as a Palestinian, uh, there are... Uh, a, a Texan, you know, there is a Palestine, Texas. Um, so, you know, I've known that for years, and then there has to come a moment where you're like, what does that mean? Other than, you know, bringing Milton's paradise into it. So I decided to share with you, or to write a poem that I can share with you about that. Of course, in Depending on the state, I think the pronunciation can be Palestine, which is closer to the Arabic pronunciation, uh, Palestine. Of course, Philistine, which is a lovely euphemism. So, um, so Palestine, Texas. So it's a longish prose poem. I've never been, I said to my friend, who'd just come back from there. Oh, you should definitely go, she said. The original Palestine is in Illinois. She went on. 
A pastor was driven out of, by Palestine's people and it hurt him so badly he had to rename somewhere else after it. Or maybe it goes back to a 17th century Frenchman who traveled with his vision of milk and honey or the nut who believed in dual seeding. What's that? I asked. That's when an egg is fertilized by two sperm, she said. Is that even viable? I asked. It is, she said, on rare occasions, though nothing guarantees the longevity of the resulting twins. She spoke like a scientist, but was a professor of the humanities at heart. Viability, she added, depends on the critical degree of disproportionate defect distribution for a miracle to occur. If there is life, only one twin lives. That night, we went to the movies looking for a good laugh. It was a Coen Brothers feature whose unheralded opening scene rattled off Palestine this, Palestine that, and the other. It did the trick. We were granted the right to exist. It must have been there and then that my wallet slipped out of my jeans back pocket and under the seat. The next morning, I went back. With a flashlight that the manager had lent me, I found the wallet unmoved. This was the second time in a year that I'd lost and retrieved this modern cause of sciatica in men. <laughs> Months earlier, it was at a lily pond I'd gone hiking to with the same previously mentioned friend. It was around twilight. Another woman going in with her boyfriend as we were coming out picked it up, put it in her little backpack, and weeks later texted me the photo of his kneeling and her standing with right hand over mouth to thwart the small bird in her throat from bursting. If the bird escapes, the cord is severed and the heart plummets. She didn't want the sight of joy caught in her teeth. He sat his phone camera on its pod and set, set it in lapse mode. She wrote in her text to me, I welled up. She would become a bride and my wallet was part of the proposal. This made me a token of their bliss, though I'm not sure how her fiance might feel about my intrusion, if he'd care at all. It's a special wallet, wallet I texted back. It's been with me for the better part of two decades, ever since a good friend got it for me as a present. He was from Ohio. I turned and said to my film mate, who was listening to my story. Ohio? She seemed surprised. Yes, I replied quizzically. There's also a Palestine in Ohio, she said. Barely anyone lives there anymore. All of them barely towns off country roads. I think there are 13 <laughs> Palestines in America, and not one in Palestine. That's why I'm here. I can have my Palestines. 13, could it be 12, 14, 13, what a lucky number. I'm not sure actually. There's a lovely essay that uh, the wonderful Anton Chamas written in, I think in 1994, 96, something like that in uh, Three Penny Review about something to do, it turns out that the essay is about Palestine, Michigan. So just in case you're curious, so it seems like it's, a, it's an affliction for some Palestinian Americans to chase these little towns. Um, I, I want to also read this poem, which is special to me, if I can find it. Bloodline. Being a Houstonian, we have, for anyone who'd been to Houston, there is uh, uh, the Menil Museum and the Atwombly Museum and the Rothko Chapel. And so this poem began after, I began writing this poem after I finished a week in the hospital, like a, a week you know, shift, and uh, I was quite exhausted on Friday morning, so uh, bloodline. Make sure I'm not, oh, I'm almost done, maybe. A beetle with phosphorescent indigo wings I had assumed were radium yellow cascaded down the glass of God to the table by your right arm. And I said 
that a painter friend of mine with inflammatory vessels in her mind, an ailment whose choice of flesh is blood vessel muscle, had told me that indigo is like the untranslatable in every language. Synonym overlap too low for coefficient. Rothko's chromatography or electrophoresis in and out of his chapel. A Mexican rabbi doctor from Aleppo had recently shared with me that he'd seen the work but didn't get the art in it. I told him he'd have to go into it knowing Rothko didn't see the spirit bright and didn't see it hurtful either. Though it could be that it's Rothko retro days and Twombly's mausoleum across the street under a Whitman oak and the city's grackles at sunset on treetops and ledges, on traffic lights and wires, along feeders and highways, wild song and murmuration. Then the rabbi said that once as a boy, his father had reproached him for mocking Arabic, which his father spoke and loved. And my father knew love, he said. So maybe that's indigo. I said. You said your beetle had landed and was wholly tranquil for a second before it buzzed off again. I said yesterday the signs were many. You said perhaps I'd seen too many millimoles of someone else's life that anyone passing through might own a share in, someone else's dying. I said that too. A Jewish doctor from Waco told me years ago, sometimes people survive in spite of us. And I'll finish with this brief poem called Corona Radiata, which is one of those, um, uh, I think it has a, you know, it has a, like, it's an expression, this, this kind of limitation of language that offers itself to multiple metaphors. So it, it, it is some sort of a philosophical metaf uh, metaphysical concept. But also it is a, a structure in the brain where the white matter branches out into the gray matter and, and uh, uh, it's dense neurons that give it this uh, look. But it is also, um, and that's my favorite association with the expression, projections of the ovum um, that actually sort of a sperm has to negotiate. Uh, they, they sort of like a, a spiked shield for the ovum before conception They're called corona radiata. To erase myself, I erase myself. Quiet, Silent, mute, clay, fire, light, cold, shadow, sun, sorrow, meadow, wild, river, sea, land, drunk, sober, want, seize, release, expunge, part, splice, plunge, Sound, ear, mouth, word, wood, world. Thank you.